Good evening and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church's Bible Study. Here we're studying the lectionary scriptures for this coming Sunday, uh, which is August 11th, believe it or not. We're getting to the middle of August already, and we are going to be going through these texts. And I want you to just sit back and relax and join in and hear how the, the Spirit is calling us to meditate on these words for this evening. St. James Presbyterian Church is on the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue, and you can reach us on our website at www.stjamesharlemnyc.org. Thanks be to God. Our opening psalm is Psalm 138, another one of these Psalm of Ascents, which we know is a psalm that um, they are named as such because they were used by the multitudes and many of the people as they were approaching Jerusalem, approaching Zion. Uh, many times we think in our grouping, as we talked about it, in terms of how they are going there for the high holy days. And this is a prayer for redemption, actually. It's waiting for the Lord's redemption, an individual petition seeking to come from out of the depths. Um, it has other, you know, these common features of uh, petitions waiting for the resolutions to wait for the Lord, saying we're going to wait for the Lord because the Lord will deliver, uh, teaching others to revere the Lord, and asking that God please, please, please hear our psalm. And in the middle, it will remind God, um, in case God has forgotten, God, you are a forgiving God. <laughs> so with all of my iniquities, I'm, I know that you just want to be reminded that uh, there is forgiveness in you. So let us hear Psalm 138. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all. All evening psalm. It is a an appropriate psalm as we move forward and think about um, as we move through Second Samuel again. We're moving through the tale of David and all that David has been going through. I guess I, for the past couple of weeks, I, unintentionally, I've been focusing my preaching on David and some of these aspects of the Second Samuel text. So this has been on my mind as well. Um, so let me hear your thoughts about this particular psalm before we move on. I think it's very reassuring and I think it brings to me comfort because he forgives and we try every, well, I try every day. I know I fall short. And so it just um, reminds me that um, not only does he forgive me, but that I should be mindful of my forgiveness for others. So that's what it reminds uh, me of. Mm -hmm. yeah, very nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and speaking about that too, Linda, one of the things that, and just reading the comments beforehand and thinking about this, I love the idea of um, that this psalm always even though we're talking about that we are in the depths and that we're in the midst of it all and we're asking desperately for the Lord to hear our voice, there's just a reminder that, oh yeah, I am praying to a forgiving God mm -hmm. and how that twist of hope pulls us out of the depths just a bit to know that we that no matter what is happening, that God is still there and that we can wait for the Lord. We will wait mm -hmm. and we will hope. Um, I, I find great comfort in that myself. Mm -hmm. Is there another who would like to say anything about this particular psalm? 
the line that asks if God should count iniquities as sins, who mm -hmm. could stand? You know, it, it, it just shows that we're all, you know, nothing. Mm -hmm. If God starts laying out everything that we do wrong, you know? Woo. Yeah, I see. I see somebody with a clipboard and a checklist. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when others wrong you. Yeah, yeah. And I think it reminds me of you know. Too, I have um. This coming week, I don't know if you know, Miss Dot Jarman passed away. Oh no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she passed away. So. You know, there's been a split in our church with her family. That's just edgy. But of course, the um, funeral will be um, preached by our former minister who's gone on uh, to form his own church. Right. So, you know, it's it's going to be a little challenging. And it just this just reminds me that whatever it is that I feel as though someone else is looking at me to say, that's an iniquity. This scripture reminds me, mm -hmm. but everybody has them. So who would stand? Nobody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it reminds me, kind of in that sense, it gives me that sense of of relief to say, you know, it doesn't matter what others think. It doesn't matter in that space of you know accusations and whatever. Um, that everybody, you know, he he hears it and and mm -hmm. he understands. That, um, you know, I do feel anxiety about going, but, um, yeah. yeah, but I know who Dot was and she was a strong person. And so she would expect me, um, just to kind of yeah. like, yeah, break to be there. And Dot had no legs. She was a double amputee. Mm -hmm. So every Sunday I took her to church in a wheelchair, which was, believe me, to get her into our church was just. Every, for, for years, oh, I just took her in for years. So, you know, I just, I just think this just reminds me that whatever it is that may come my way, first and foremost, you know, I'm, I'm asked to forgive. That's it. Yeah. And I'll just add um, to well, that. Let me, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, right. and then verse in verse four where it says, but there's forgiveness with you so that you may be revered so um, that in the end, God is on the throne and God is the reason why we have hope. And I think that's the, the line that stands out for me uh, is that it's, it's all about uh, revering God through all of this. So um, prayers for you, Linda, in the, in, in your anxiety. Yeah. And to piggyback on that question, that, that you know, for a Christian, that question le leads us to think about who could stand? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I can keep mm -hmm. that in my mind as I walk in, if I can keep that in well, my you know, mind. You know, you know, in your mind, for what I would suggest as well, um, is for with the Lord there is steadfast love. Seven mm -hmm. B. That's a that's a that's a beautiful mantra. Um, is like we will fail as human beings with our steadfast love, but with the Lord there is steadfast love, and I can do my best to keep repeating that and hold on and hold on to that and. It takes it away from from me. Very, that's one of my favorite um, phrases in the Psalms. Is for the with the Lord there is steadfast love. Um, I believe this is the third time this year that this <laughs> Psalm has been in this lectionary. Um, so may it may it may we find something from it for us. May it teach us something um, that we that we long that God longs for us to know. Mm -hmm. And I and know also, he. Uh, I'm sorry. And also, you're going to be there for her. Mm -hmm. Nobody else, you know? And anybody who tries to come to you and talk stuff, you just remind them, I'm here for that. 
That's yeah. it. I, you know, mm-hmm. that, um, I mean, I, uh, yeah, you know, the space of love, and that is one that, of course, she she was a person who loved. She's very free-willed and strong, but free in her space of love and faith. Um, I know that, that, that that's a space that I have to stand in. My mother always said, well, anybody can love the lovely, but can you love the unlovely? And those are the spaces where you stand mm. in and you're just tested. And I, you know, so, you know, I know, yeah, this, this, I've already seen some already. That's, and so I just kind of keep trying to recenter myself and remind myself that, you know, God would expect me to be able to withstand it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And she knew my heart. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And please give the family my love, Kyra. Will do. Let them yes. know that I'm thinking of yes. them as well. Will do. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you mm-hmm. so much. Thank you, Linda. I hope that we, you know, that we'll be praying for you. When's the funeral? Thank you. Prayers received. When? And need it. When is the funeral? Thursday. Linda, when is the funeral? Thursday. All right, everybody. Thursday. Prayer war. You know what to do on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> get your get your prayers on. Get your yeah. get your get your um what do I call it? get uh, cocoa butter butter ready for my knees and get on my knees. Yes. Grease my knees. Yes. 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 That it will be peaceful and that both churches will stand in that space of peace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, our second reading is first. Our, our first reading, actually, the text besides the psalm is Second Samuel, um, verses chapter eighteen, verses five through nine, verse fifteen, and then verses thirty-one through thirty-three. Very selective, as you can see in our sele- in our lectionary text today, but it basically tells the entire story of the defeat and death of Absalom, um, David's son, from chapter eighteen, verse one through. Um, Chapter 19, verse 10. Um, Ali and Young said, always read what's before and read what's after so that you can, from what's chosen, so that you can get the context of this. This is a very difficult, difficult passage in a lot of ways. Um, if we, okay, let's just, let's think about it politically for a moment. Remember when David um, took over leadership from Saul. One of the reasons why it was such an incredible thing was because Saul had divided the country, the north and the south, and David brought them back together. Hmm. Brought the together and brought the nation of Israel is trying to usurp David's um, authority. What's happened with him is that he has fractured the country again. So he is doing a lot of stuff up in the north, and David is down in the south. And as you know, I've been sort of really praying around this whole notion of what is going on with David and where his heart is and where his mind is and where God's um, intention for him is despite his humanity. And this whole idea that um, he's got some issues going on in his family, as God said there would be last year, last week in our text. And this is one of those major major items. The son tries to take over his um, kingdom and tries to get the north to go against him and tries to usurp him. So there is a huge, huge battle that is going on. One of the things that comes to me in this battle um, that I sort of do in one of my little footnotes of my, my own is that you recognize that this battle, they're talking about these thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I'm realizing that David also has many allies around him. There are many allies, because there, there's another mention of a Hittite um, in this battle that is one of David's, uh, David has like these 30 or 40 like really close generals and leaders and commanders of his armed forces. And those people, some are, many are from the nation, from, the, from you know, from our, our, from our Israelites, and many aren't. And so, you, you really find out when they start to talk about like who's from where and what's doing what. But this shows you the magnitude of the battle is not just for the nation of Israel and the two sides, but it's also for stabilization of the region. Um, because there's 
all of these allies that David has and all these people that are fighting with one another. And the Northern um, section has all of their allies as well. So I just wanted you to hear a little bit about that little background um, because this text that we're about to read, um, it hits upon the nuances of many of the details, many of the nuances, but it doesn't get into a lot of the details of this. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background that this is going on and on. And it's a huge deal. So then there comes this huge battle that has been going on um, that, that comes to bear now in front of David. And the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel. And the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David. And the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country. And the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord the king, for the Lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. When the scripture came up, I immediately texted ruling other Andrea Bradford because Eric Whitaker has this piece. Um, and it is one of the most haunting uh, choral passages of music that lasts for about 15 minutes. And it is just David's lament. And it is, it is one of the things that has always sort of echoed in my heart that has actually changed my theology, even around this particular text. It's really incredible. So let's sort of go through this here um, a little bit. Through David's order concerning Absalom, the writer shows that David is not responsible for Absalom's death. So this is one of the few times that David gets to say, okay, well, I... I, I I'm not responsible. He's not, we get to see him who has done a lot of killing before, who has done a lot of impetuous killing before. He's not responsible for this one. Also at this time in this, jo Joab and Abishai and Ittai also say to David, David says to them, I'm ready to go out and battle with you. I will go and I will fight. And they tell David to stay behind. That's an important thing that that's not in our particular text. David is asked to, is told, we're advising you to stay behind. Because if we die um, in this particular battle, um, then we just die. But if you die as the king, um, then it will mean something even more politically in the area. So David says, I will follow your advice. And then he gives them these orders. Verses 6 through 8. David chooses strategically the rugged forests of Ephraim as the battle site, thereby countering large numbers of Absalom's army. The location of this forest of Ephraim is unknown because the story is set east of the Jordan 
but the territory of the tribe of Ephraim is west of the Jordan. However, this is another benefit afforded him by the delay that Hushai achieved. There's an opportunity in a former battle that um, there was a delay in the battle because of this person, Hushai, and David is able to think strategically and move his troops into a place where they are on the other side of this deep, deep forest, which is hard to penetrate and hard to navigate. And as we see, it was so hard that 20,000 people were lost um, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. There is much metaphorical um, imagery in this episode of Absalom's death. Mule. David and his sons rode on, on mules as a royal mount. So this riding on a mule for the people of Israel of the king is a royal mount, not on a steed, not on an Arabian horse, and not on a white horse. It's on an actual mule. And of course, we get the imagery of that because what happens on Palm Sunday? <laughs> so when you think about where this comes from, um, where this um, tradition comes from of the king riding on, on a mule, it happens here with David and David's sons. The unseating from the mule, when he was unseated from the mule, symbolizes his loss of the kingdom. The great oak unseats him and he is unseated by the mighty oak, being caught by the head fast in the oak, recalls his glorious head of hair that has been mentioned earlier about Absalom. It suggests that pride was his downfall, similar to Goliath. And perhaps it's a literary allegory and metaphor throughout the text that those who have long and luscious hair are very often thought of as being prideful. Um, and how they are presented with that. So this, this sort of also gives the notion in just this one verse about this pride, his un being unseated, um, what that means um, symbolically for him as a, as, a, as a wannabe king, and also, you know, riding on this mule as a royal mount. Ten young men who struck him dead. This is very a very strategic way of writing about this as well, because no individual could actually be, be blamed for the actual killing. You can't say it's one person or the other because they all jumped in on it. Um, also protection from, from David and other punishment. And then we have this Cushite. The Cushite is came and said good tidings and gives him all the good news. And of course we know that in our, in our, in our text that the Cushites are either Nubian or Ethiopian. And this Nubian and Ethiopian thinks that Absalom's death is, a, is also good news. Perhaps he's not one of the commanders or of the armies of Israel, but this ally that I was telling you about, that didn't get the import of the message because in 18.5, chapter 18, verse 5, you know, um, David says, deal gently with him. That's the, the verse that we read at the very beginning, mm -hmm. to deal gently with Absalom. And this combined with this great, great grief, as he's, you know, this, this plaintive plea of mentioning my son, my son, my son, my son. It's a great grief, but it actually starts to stir a bit of distrust and envy among his troops. Because David is weeping more and showing more love for his enemy, they feel, than he is showing for those who love him. So it's a it's a beautiful, a beautiful depth of emotion and, and, and weeping and, and grief over his son, but it also has implications. Um, for the power of David over all of these people that he's commanding as well. So this is this little episode that we have between um, that has to deal with the loss of Absalom and his defeat and the strange way of the reunification of Israel coming forth in a way. Your thoughts on this? Hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> It, it is kind of disjointed in a way, um, because the, the whole notion of the Kushite comes almost as a surprise, you know, um, yeah. uh, and, and now that you've gone through and explained it a little bit better, it's clear, but it, initially, I, I didn't understand why they would go from uh, the, the, the Joab's armor bearers killing him and then the Kushite. Um, and it was it just wasn't clear. Um, well, and why what happened, why the Kushite? What, what also happens is that David is waiting on the gate. He's waiting mm. on top, like one who wa who waits. Uh... Let's see. <laughs> it's frozen. You know, like the song, waiting for those who bring, waiting the or or watch or the watch, um, watch keepers on the gates and. David is waiting up there and then nice. ends up happening while they're waiting. He sees two people running towards him and he's trying to figure out if one person comes, there's good news. And if another person comes, he does, he's not sure of the news. So these two people are running neck and neck and the Cushite ends up getting there first. And I believe the, 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 the point of that is, is that one person is coming to, simply just talk about the defeat of the battle and to and to sort of is very wary about how to sort of David and yet the Kushite does not have this whole history, has the history, but is much more excited about the victory being won and even about the death of Absalom. So there's this there's this race that is actually running to the gate. There and there are like three or four, three at least three three or four chapters in the chapter after this that like you say this is so disjointed because there's so much that happens in all these chapters right. what stands out to me is that and I think you alluded to it um, it was the Lord that took Absalom's life it, you know it wasn't David any of his soldiers any of the country pe countrymen around him, it was the Lord that led that 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 um, mule under that tree at that particular time and snatched him off of there. You know, it uh, kind of reminds me of the story about the talking <laughs> donkey that you know yeah. saw disaster coming and kept um, stubbornly. Um, refusing to move forward, even though he was berated and beaten, and God allowed him to talk, and mm -hmm. he was telling him that of what he was seeing, you know, and so it's sort of like a parallel there, you know, in one instance, someone was saved, prevented from disaster, and the other one, someone was just led straight into disaster. Uh, I'm that, to that, that wording because I do want to get I'm looking uh -huh. at the wording of le of he was left hanging between heaven and earth hmm. yeah and the mule, That's the mule just so yeah so that kind of it kind of reminds you the imagery to me of um you know during the times of the you know 20s and 30s of the lynchings where the bodies just hung you get that the same tree. image, yeah, on the tree. They just hung, or well, they just hung in the air. You know, they, they just. That's what I visualized, as uh, Absalom was just hanging there, and and then I I just thought as he was hanging there, the t ten young men were just merciless. They struck him. Yeah. They killed him. He was already dying. I'm sure if his head's in the oak, and he's hanging. So that's pretty violent. Mm -hmm. I, I made I a mistake. Often, um, uh, go ahead. Uh -huh. No, no, I, I didn't like this cut. <laughs> I didn't like the way they cut the scripture up. Because I, <laughs> because I felt like it wasn't true to the entirety of the story, right? Like it was just 
kind of a really highly edited version of the story and maybe that was the point of it but um joab stabbed absalom like three times the the verse before we get and i thought it was really interesting that they said 10 young men killed absalom even though joab was the one that stabbed him in the heart three times and didn't even want to discuss him not dying and i'm from cleveland and it made me think of and, and one of the sisters did say it earlier when everyone's responsible, no one's responsible. Right. How exactly. that messy thing benefits people who execute violence? Because we had somebody who, we had two people that were murdered in a police chase because they had a car that backfired and they were shot. <laughs> there were 176 shell casings found and yeah. no one was convicted because everyone participated. Yeah, that's pretty. This, then this is right here in this text. You are exactly right. You know, I, I do want to clear up that the Kushite didn't get there first. I want you to hear this um, from verse 28. There's a there's a, a son of Zadok who's coming as well and bringing tidings. And that's the first one that gets there, um, Ahimaaz. And Ahimaaz crying out to the king, all is well. He prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground and said, Blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. The king said, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Ahimaaz said, When Joab sent your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I do not know what it was. <laughs> the king said, Turn aside, stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. And then we get to our text. Then the Cushite came. Oh, okay. So there's the as as Aja was referring to as well. There are these people that are just trying to trying to like sort of skirt past the entire thing as well. And those are the people that that's what the person who got there first. But then the truth sort of not the truth the half truth came out. <laughs> he didn't want to be the one to tell the king. <laughs> Nobody they, wanted to hear bad news, but they left me <laughs> to the cookhouse. David doesn't have a good <laughs> reputation of hearing bad news very well. <laughs> but they left it to the cookhouse. Like, that's what I thought was, an was another part. I'm like, there's a whole lot of shadiness and manipulation going on here. Someone saw mm -hmm. the king in the church. Someone, no names, someone saw it. And the cookhouse is the one that... The foreigner is the one that's being sent to get this terrible news when David is a hot hit. I just thought all that was like shit. Well, well, here, here's here's what we sort of spoke about last week too with the text, Aja, is that um, last week when God told David, um, your your household is going to suffer, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Um, that there was a a bit of. Um, the confession of David saying, I have sinned against the Lord. Um, that this is sort of where some of his, even his grief and his passion for all the, all the trouble that his kids go through, all the, all the suffering that they go through, he still somehow has this deep depth of love for them because he understands in a way that this is what his fate is with God. He may be able to lead a generation will lead but in his lifetime so his his attitude sort of shifts with this confession is i have sinned against the lord and that's when all this stuff starts happening and people aren't really aware of this confession that he's had with nathan so they're not aware of the of the the spiritual shift that has happened in david so this is almost a test of that in a way and we find out that he says you know he, he rather mourns the death um rather than take the revenge. Right. Yeah. So it's like this whole, this is like an epic, epic story. <laughs> <laughs> this David. Um, but yeah, this, I, I do encourage um, at least to sort of read like, um, like 19 verses 1 through 10 or so yeah verses 1 through 10 so that you can see the the disc the discontent 
that occurs after this among the people um, and among those who, while David is grieving, they really can't stand this grieving process that he has. Mm -hmm. But also to recognize, and this is something that I always point out, um, that this Kushite, this Nubian, this Ethiopian, um, this, just like Uriah was a Hittite and a foreigner in a strange land fighting on the side of David, they were supposed to be revered. Um, and Aja, that's another reason why they probably let the, the Kushite tell the bad news, because Honestly, um, there's a whole other, you don't want to get into another national war with someone because someone is coming to tell you the news. So they're also like waiting for him to tell the bad news as well. So those people are sort of pushing him to the forefront. Also, you know, who knows what David's going to do with this attitude, but also it's just sort of shady to get, get the brother to tell the bad news. <laughs> Right, what tells us he was privileged uh, as a Kushite or Ethiopian that he he would have had a level of privilege and been treated better? Yes. Okay. Cool. Cool. I didn't. I did not know that. I was like, why send the black guy? <laughs> well, when I when I was when we were doing the the background work on Uriah the Hittite and recognizing that he was one of the one thirty of uh, one of thirty of the top soldiers of David, which is what made his betrayal so horrible as well it was that that as a as a as an alien foreigner that david takes into his um into his personal space like that he is beholden by their law and by their traditions to treat them with the utmost of respect which is why uriah was given <laughs> his wife <laughs> in bathsheba crazy wow <laughs> but this part of this um in our trajectory of of how we were sort of looking at david's possibly being able to be the one to say wow you know maybe my sinning against the lord and god telling me that my that all of this is going to happen in the sun it's not going to happen i did what i did in the night god said what's going to happen to me is going to happen in the sun and sure enough this is everything that god is saying coming to bear and it's coming to bear at the same in the same instance that his role as king designated by god um brings the people back together and is being blessed by god the nation is being blessed by god while his household is falling apart. So his role that he's been assigned and chosen for is still being uplifted. And yet he's got to give over who he is because who he is is one whom God has said, you have sinned against me. And also Derek, I was just thinking that um, going backwards, you know, when the people demanded a king like the kings of mm -hmm. other countries around them and they got Saul and it didn't work out so well for them and then they got David and then David was a different kind of king yeah all together um he did kingly things but he also did ordinary people things and in this mourning that he had for his children it's almost reflective of how God mourns over his children. Oh, yeah. Very much so. It's like when, um, it, it was like when the scripture that says Jesus went in his entry over, you know, to Jerusalem, he overlooked the city and he wept because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, it sort of like ties into that. Isn't it strange? Isn't it wild how we're starting to see how all of these things are woven into? Yeah. Um, and that's why it was so, that's why it's so important that all these little nuances that we're finding that are sort of being lifted up in, in our gospel lessons as well, they were done for a reason. They were done to convince the Jewish people that Jesus is you know, of, of of the lineage of David, that Jesus is the one that they're waiting for. And they're leaving, they're like weaving together all of these clues from their past into that, into that imagery. 
It's fascinating. So and this also, I think, is I think this is the first the first thing that happens to David after um, he sins against the Lord. Is that right? I think so, because there's just a lot of war that goes on, and actually, right. um, let's see, first loss. Didn't so his baby died? die? No, the one that yes. he got on that, the first day. His first, his first baby died with um, Bathsheba. Um, mm -hmm. uh, actually, there's a couple of things that goes on. Um, there are there is his son that rapes his rapes his daughter, mm -hmm. and then there's the death there. Um, so there's like there's like all oh, this horrible like chapter thirteen, um, and Absalom, Absalom, and and and, and Amnon. And Amnon sort of get in, into it because Absalom is the one who finds out and says to his sister Tamar, "Did he lie with you?" Mm -hmm. And didn't Absalom kill his brother? Yes. Mm -hmm. So sort of like uh, Cain and Abel all over again. Yes. Messy, mm -hmm. messy, messy. Because <laughs> I'm sure that 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 comes out in the grief too, you know, when he's mourning oh, yeah. Absalom, the the things that have happened, and the the fact that Absalom is his quote pride and joy, so to speak, and now you know it's sort of uh, one more, you know. It's kind of sad. And, and the and the things that the things that were going on amongst his children are, yeah also reflective of the deep sins that we have produced over the millennia. I mean, like, how how bad can it get? It's like we're, we're looking at American politics right now, and every day is worse than the day before, and we're like, what? You know? Right. Right. But it happened as far back as the Bible, that and more. Uh, uh, history, history repeats itself always, mm -hmm. and when we don't pay attention to it, we repeat it very often. Mm -hmm. And that's my issue with Christian nationalism. <laughs> oh yeah, I have a lot of issues with them. It's <laughs> like well, you know. Well, anyway, so we'll that we'll save that for another conversation because we have too much <laughs> to get through. And let's go to this continuation of appeal for a new way of life, not life, life, starting in verse 17, because um, with verse 17, Ephesians 4, verse 17, sort of really is trying to deal with this whole new way of light, uh, how to live a new way of life that um, Paul has been sharing with the Ephesians um, while we have been going through this. And so let us hear his continuation of his conversation of it in his letter with them. And they have a lot of allusions to other texts in this. And, and there's intertextual, which are other texts throughout the, the, the Jewish canon. And then there's intratextual. He has a lot of um, references back to his verses in the beginning of the letter and so on and so forth. And I tried to parse some of them out. Um, Second reading is Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2. So then, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members. Be angry, but do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not make room for the devil. <laughs> Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away all from you all the bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. 
as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Speak the truth is a re reference to um, verse 15 in chapter 4, which is speaking the truth in love. He's reminding them, let us all speak the truth also in love to our neighbors. Um, this verse 26 is a reference to 1 Corinthians 13 as well. It's sort of the same mindset. For this is what love is not. Love is not angry, resentful, and so on and so forth. Um, so don't let the sun go down on your anger because that is what love is not. This building up. This is a metaphor from, from chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. And it says, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place of God. Let no evil come out of your mouths, only what is useful for this building up together spiritually into a dwelling place of God. Self-referential, intra-textual. The seal, um, the seal is in, as in chapter 1, verse 13, where he mentions you are sealed, and it is, we talked about that as being a sign of ownership and protection of God. And this day of redemption is when God's plan comes to completion. The day of redemption is when God's plan comes to completion. This is what the Basileia of God, this is what this whole notion is all about. God's plan coming to completion. God's completion. Our, our salvation is within this, yes. However, the plan of completion that we own as individual salvation is truly salvation for the world, the earth, people, the cosmos, animals, restored order with salvation granted. We are a part of God's plan of completion to bring order back under the auspices of how God wants it to be. And very often, in, in, and this is my own, per, my own um, projection, I will say, my own theological projection and hermeneutic, we, especially in American Christianity, we place ourselves at the center of the story all the time. We place our salvation at the center of that God is only doing all of this just for us, but God has a plan for all of the cosmos, and we are a part of that, a beloved part of that, yes, but it, 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 we have to recognize that we are, I believe that we are a part of sort of bringing to completion all that God is planning. That means the universe, that means, that means the cosmos, that means ecology. That means building the justice system. That means doing social justice so that people feel free, so that people can thrive. It means ending hunger. It means ending poverty. All of that is part of God's plan. And our salvation is a part of that, a part of making that happen. It's not just about us being saved. It's about us being saved so that we can help bring God's plan to completion. That's my sermon about the way that we can be in the world. This fragrant offering um, and sacrifice to God. Gods of the ancient Near East are often depicted as enjoying the odor of sacrificial animals. Genesis 8, 21, Exodus 29, 18, Ezekiel 20, 41. And I also believe that what the, common, the person who wrote the commentary did not put in is that it is also very, very much so for those who are offering, um, who are making offerings to 
the Roman pantheon, pantheon of gods. Uh, there's always this burning, fragrant offering and sacrifices as well. And I tell you, it's sort of like when you think about a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God in terms of animal sacrifices, just think about driving by a barbecue <laughs> and how pleasing that might be. And um, this fragrant odor as a sacrifice to God, but it wasn't really a barbecue barbecue. But if you think about that scent, um, what they're talking about. So I just sort of pontificate a lot about this particular Ephesians text. And I am willing to be wrong. I just needed to sort of speak to that a little bit. Any thoughts, ideas? I feel like I should print out this particular scripture and send it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was Paul's intent. That's a thought. <laughs> That's a thought. That's a very tempting thought. That is Paul's mm -hmm. intent. Spread my words. Spread my letters around. Mm -hmm. That's why he said, come mm -hmm. gather around. We got something to read to you from Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I love the fact that this is sort of like he continues like this is about a continuation of how to live this life in Christ for the, the for the people of Ephesus. You know, it's a continuation of appeal for a new way of living. If we go back to verse 17, so 17 through all the way through this, just copy all of that <laughs> as well. Verses 31 and 32 are the ones that kind of get to the heart of it. <laughs> when Paul knows how to write a letter. He knows yes. how to write this. Exactly, exactly. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> well, you know, another thing that stood out to me was verse 28. And it talks about thieves must give up stealing rather than <laughs> rather let them labor and work honestly with their hands so as to have something to I'll share with the needy. And so to me, what really stands out about that particular line is that so as to have something to share with the needy, not just, just to provide for yourself, for your family, but provide for other people who don't have. Yeah. Paul, Paul is very aware in this, you know, I talk about the empire all the time. Paul is very aware of how poor people are very much forced um, to, be, to be thought of as always stealing and, and thieving, especially in these mixed communities, these mixed economic communities. Um, it's like, but... Let's let's have people labor, you know, labor honestly so that we can figure out how we might be. Because the whole idea about building a community is to be able to share with the needy. That's that's one of the the, the trademarks of the early church, of uh, the early Basile, of uh, the early um, Ecclesia, is to come together, not to be beholden on the mores of society, but to come together for everything into one common area so that we can share with one another and share with the needy. Um, and also those thieves are those people who are tax collectors and those thieves who are stealing, who are marking up prices and so on and so forth. Yes, Later, that's what I was thinking get, of. Get a fair, I need money get a overseas. And that's what I was mm -hmm. thinking of. It's not just the thieves that are the type that are just stealing, but it's those who, even if you say you're working honestly, but you're hiding money or you're sending money. You know, his point is that, you know, you not only that you make enough money, but that you make enough money to make a difference and share with the needy. You better preach. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're all right now. <laughs> Verse, 28 out. Verse 28 stood out to me too, because what I thought about was, wow, they actually lived in a society where if people could work an honest job, they would have something to share. <laughs> With the needy, I thought that that really um, mm -hmm. stood out because, like, that is definitely not the society we live in today. Mm -hmm. And I thought about how cool it might be that, oh, you actually go do an honest day's work and come home with enough money to live off of and share. Must yeah. be all. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I grew up in a generation where that was sort of the norm in the community. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my Aunt Dot, I always talk about her. My aunt Dot 
would welcome you into her home on a Sunday and throughout the week if you needed something to eat. And she worked hard for her money. We all did. But the, but the whole idea that if somebody needed something, that they could come to you in community, that's how many communities made it, especially in a time of segregation, especially in a time of you know prejudice when, when yeah. things were hard. That's one of the, the saving graces. I believe that... Um, oppressive communities and communities of different cultures. I thought I wanted to check it right away. African-American communities and other cultures that, that are cultures of diaspora, they get this. Yeah, sure. I they, get, they get that the whole idea is to work honestly so that we have something to share with one another and with the needy. Um, so that's sort of, that's sort of a, something that I miss um, in certain spaces as well. So I get you, Aja. And then, um, and then just a quick thing on verse 30, part A, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That, <laughs> that just made me think of when you do something wrong and <laughs> your mom is like, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Ooh, the yeah. idea that we could disappoint the Holy Spirit by behaving in the, in the, in the way that he's describing that we shouldn't behave really sat with me too. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, well. Here's another sermon. <laughs> That's another one. That is so true. Mm -hmm. That's the Holy yes. Spirit could be disappointed yeah. mm. in us. Yes, yeah, in us. You are marked, and so you have to live to that. Yes, uh, most definitely. I missed that. So thank you. And for you know that, that. that also speaks to you know last week when David said. I have sinned against the living God. I mean, Nathan brought up all of his sins and told him what he did and all that was wrong. And he didn't, I mean, it wasn't so much, I mean, he, he understood the import of what he did, but what really broke his heart is yeah. that line where he said, I have sinned against God. The whole, God is disappointed in me. Yeah. You better go ahead, Aja. To piggyback on what uh, she said, it's like the parents tell you, like your whole, all, all your ancestors are turning over in their graves because of what you did, you know? Some pressure there. Not the ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> Not grandmama and them, as we said. And, and them. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Good point. Well, well, yeah. we, got, we got about what five sermons out of this little pericope? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna definitely listen to the tape, man. <laughs> <laughs> some Sunday, some some weeks I don't listen to the tape, but I will definitely listen to the tape this week. Listening to this one, huh? Yeah. Um, okay, you I'm said gonna five. Get yeah, the five or six. We're getting there, and we got we still got the gospel to go. <laughs> yes, you still got the gospel. Yes, we are going to continue on with John six thirty five and forty one through fifty one. If you remember a few weeks ago when Jesus um, raised up and said Talitha kum, and the girl got up and ate something, we often we brought up the idea that when we hear about Jesus feeding and people getting up and feeding, that it very often is a nod to the of abundance and the promised life um, in the Basileia of God, in the kingdom of God. So I neglected, because we didn't have Bible study last week, I neglected, I didn't let us know that, imagine what that means then for feeding of 5,000. <laughs> the, feeding of, the feeding of the people and that opportunity is a, a, a bold, bold witness and claim I'm to the of the of the of the kingdom of God. And We're Jesus continues. Yeah. Jesus continues with that idea by saying, Jesus said to them, I am the bread yes. of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes come, in come me will never be thirsty. Come, baby. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, or I am, comma, the bread that came down from heaven. 
They were saying, is this not Jesus? I'm trying to check the dog. The son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent it. And I will rate that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. And they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. (laughs) This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. As we go through this text and I read some of the notations from it, I want you to remember that in the very beginning of John, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God, blah, blah, blah. And I also want you to remember that Logos um, was made male in gender. And this word and this notion of what was with God, it stems from wisdom. Wisdom was with God. And in the Jonine text, it becomes Logos. It becomes the male um, gendered role for gendered word for um, word, but it's the same notion of wisdom. And when we talk about wisdom and Sophia wisdom, the feminine wisdom that is all throughout um, the, the early, the first Testament and all throughout the wisdom literature, very often when you're reading through the book of John, every now and then it, it's good to think about, am I sensing wisdom from from the 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 wisdom literature that we have so when jesus says to them this is i'm sort of trying to unravel all this you know we go so quickly to cannibalism and and judaism saying they're mad because jesus is saying you know you can't eat the body that goes against jewish traditions to eat flesh Mm -hmm. blah 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 you also a note let me just kind of that this recalls a little water. Yep. There's also a notion that this recalls similar Faith. language to God's wisdom and surpasses it. Proverbs 9 5 says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Sirach 24 21, another wisdom text that is not in our canon goes even further and it speaks and this is Sophia Wisdom speaking and she says those who eat of me will hunger for more and those who drink of me will thirst for more and Jesus surpasses it but it to me will never be hungry whoever believes in me will never be thirsty Jesus is Logos And at the same time, he is also Sophia, wisdom, and flesh. So hold that in your mind about, and this is why John is one of those, the Jonine texts are so powerfully what they call Gnostic, because there's all this this secret knowledge and this secret mystic kind of understanding um, that is placed in the writing of it for the community of John to give them this deeper mystical understanding of it. And this is one of those arguments for it being a mystical, more of a mystical, deeper sensibility of it because it does harken back to much of the wisdom literature and Logos Mm -hmm. and, and Sophia as wisdom 
are one and the same and fleshed in Christ. Mm -hmm. How y'all like that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then verses 41 through 71, there will be complaints and dissension. So we hear, we see that um, coming across. Um, as the response to Jesus becomes more hostile, his interlocutors, interlocutors are referred to as the Jews. Echoes of the Exodus narrative, um, as the Jews complain, are seen here. So when the language is used that is has been used throughout the centuries in church life as a pejorative and saying, well, the Jews killed Jesus, the Jews did this, blah, blah, blah. There's a different notion for it here about placing the complaint and placing the fact that the people of Israel are still being the people of Israel. The Jews complained in Exodus 16.2, right before Moses comes down, right, with the, the commandments. Yeah. They're complaining. Mm -hmm. uh, Numbers 11.1, 1, they're complaining. So here they are again. God is bringing mm -hmm. all this stuff, and they're complaining yet again, right? And then this verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. That's Isaiah 54.13. It's a reference to that. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your children. And then Jesus goes on and draws this, this and weaves this further together. I say, not that anyone has ever seen the Father, because it weaves it back to what? John 1.18. He says this, not that anyone's ever seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes and blah, blah, blah. John 1 18. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is a reiteration and a redescription of that from John 1 18. And Jesus is, is pairing it with being the bread of life. Why does he mention Moses? Once again, we, we understand that Jesus is establishing his superiority to Moses. The ultimate it happens on the Mount of Transfiguration. It happens with this water that they're talking about. It happens with this bread that he's talking about as well. Verse 51 begins, um, a, is the beginning of a, a heatedly debated passage. Verses 51 through 58, because they had these allusions to the Eucharist um, about, you know, eating Jesus and eating the bread and the body. And others people read it in context of the ancient Greek hero cults that featured language about the consumption of a god. And that should be a small g. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to change that right now. The consumption of a god. However, in light of, the light, in light of what we have just spoken about in terms of the wisdom literature, I would suggest and posit a nod to the wisdom text of Sirach as mentioned earlier, where Jesus is saying, I am the living bread that whoever eats this bread will, living, will live forever. And the bread that I will give for life, for the life of the world is my flesh. And if we remember Sirach again, those who eat of me will hunger for more and those who drink of me will, of me will thirst for more. Wisdom in Sophia, Sophia in the wisdom literature is a personification. Jesus is an actualization of it. So I just wanted to throw a little bit of that context to you. And um, when they, when, when folks are sort of in the John community are really thinking about For you? what is Jesus trying to say? I have one out here. Reading this, not to, not the people to whom he's speaking, but when he's reading oh. this, when people are I reading this. I think the only thing I need, I'm going to put the, the hot dogs in this thing here. This thing right here, right? One second, you all. No. The, the context, as I, I really want you to understand, is that when this book is being read by the John community, the Joe and I community, there's a lot deeper something deeper about this being separated from the synoptic gospels, the where the synopses are the same, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that this community is is giving a, a, 
a depth of thought and mysticism um, that is often not list, list, lifted up in our analysis of it. And I just wanted to share that with you. So your thoughts on this particular text, you all, before we go. So is that what you're saying, that the John and I community have that's different from the other Gospels? Is that what you're... Yes. Okay. Yes, the John and Go Gospel is... is um, was it eked itself into the, the the canon the early church fathers thought it may have been it, it gave people a little bit too much of a, a closeness with with christ and a closeness to the mysticism that christ was offering um in relationship with us um but they ended up keeping it in okay but it it acknowledges that it did exist there. Yes, yes, and so they put it in. Mm -hmm. They put it. They put it in our canon. But it's it's um, some of the mysticism, and we sort of talk about it as the text of secret knowledge, um, which is where Gnostic comes from. But it's like this, and the secret knowledge. You know, I've talked, spoken about that before on a higher level, where, for example, when Judas is um, complaining about the woman wasting the oil for Jesus. And saying, you know, we could have fed, we could have fed the poor. That's like three hundred denarii. And then in the parenthetical, it says what? Well, he only said that because Judas used to steal <laughs> from the common okay. purse. Okay, that's that's like the secret knowledge on the surface level right. that you see. A lot okay. of that parenthetical, but it goes deeper into the mysticism of this whole idea is that we are not just ingesting bread and, and bread and water. We are actually ingesting this wisdom, this logos, this essence of divine knowledge of God that we are to walk with and we are to claim because Jesus is in us. That's from the Joe and I community of the first century. <laughs> I have to think about that a little more. Mm -hmm. I said I have to give that a little more thought. Yeah. And, and and Linda, I can say this for you, um, in terms of it, in terms of a piece of literature, it's what's what is the mysticism that is written into this literature? Um, this whole idea that Jesus is going from feeding five thousand people to say, "I'm feeding five thousand people because people are hungry," and then saying to them, and "You are only following me," as in our text last week, "You're only following me because I just fed you," but I have something that will that will feed you forever forever mm -hmm. and then he says yeah. well i'm the bread of life whoever comes to me will never be hungry then they say give give us this bread jesus give us this bread and then we get to this where he's like okay now that i've got their attention let me explain to you what this sustenance really is mm -hmm. how does so that connect like, to that uh to 49 your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Because that was bread that was provided by God to Moses. Um, because there's also previously in this text, in this, and right above this, you know, it's sort of they say um, the bread that came down from the bread that came down was not from Moses, it was from God. And this, but that was the bread that. that I'm sorry. Was, okay. <laughs> That was bread that came from God, but it was only for and they died because they the generations died out. You know, it didn't keep their spirits alive and so on and so forth. That was only a temporary food that kept them okay. Um, okay. going through the wilderness. But what Jesus is talking about. Okay. It's the yeah. spirit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Okay, that okay. I was gonna was... say I was trying trying to understand okay. that comparison, but I was going I to say that. that. It's a comparison against the temporal or the physical and the spiritual, which is eternal. Yes. Got it. Hallelujah. Thank you. That. Yes, I got that. Wow. It's... Well, you know, we do it. We got through all the texts. <laughs> it's very good. And I will have this up on YouTube tomorrow. Um... Hello? Hi, how are you? Sorry about that. 
Yeah, I was trying to get in, but I had both mute on. I said, the thing I like about this text is, is how Jesus is continuing the conversation that he's having with the same crowd of the feeding of the 5,000 that follow yeah. him yeah. across. And, you know, and so, you know, yeah, you know, you're following me because I fed you, but, you know, that it's, it's so much more than just a meal. It's so much more than just a meal. And, and, and the truth is I am, I am the bread of life. And, and so you're saying, give me a sign. What shall we do? Just believe, believe that I'm the Messiah, believe and have faith. I'm here. I'm, the presence of God has come down here and you're missing. I'm right here in front of you and you're asking for a sign. And I am, I am that. And so he goes back again to the whole Moses thing that they bring up in a manner and just how it's so woven together so succinctly is just, it's just beautiful. I know Paul gives a good argument, but this is just, just one, I think, of the best conversations mm -hmm. that he's having with folks um, that we have from the gospel. And I think we sort of forget that this chapter is 71 verses, y'all. <laughs> 71 verses, right. And it's a continuation of that 5,000 feeding story. He's still talking to these same people. He's still teaching. He's, he's still trying to get them to understand. You know, it's also the walking on the water and blah, blah, blah. Right. That's right. That's right. And the disciples who were there. And, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's just, I don't know. I'm just in awe of it. <laughs> And so many signs yeah, that they call signs. It's not miracles or anything. These are signs, mm -hmm. and and they're, I think, trying to grasp it all. Um, and he mm -hmm. brings it all together. It says, "I am, I am <laughs> the bread of life. I am everything you need. Whatever you want, do what I do. Whatever it is, I'm that. There, there you go." <laughs> And remember, and, and I think what I'll do in closing is remember I said, I, I am comma. I do that now because if we remember, there are certain, what does God say to Moses um, in the bush? I am. I am is his name. I am that I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. I am. And it is all, it, it is all about, I am be, it is, it is an action and it is a being and it is always happening always doing, always being, right? So it's sort of like when Jesus, I like the idea of, of putting a comma behind it because it reminds us that Jesus is claiming the name and reminding them that I am connected to the I am. I am connected to the being. I am connected to the always. I am connected to the always in, in motion. Well, we're about to get into some other sermons now, so we better pray our way out of here. <laughs> Amen. So, well, I am grateful to you all. Picking my brain, I, I can't see you all because I'm looking at this, and I'm so grateful for you. So thank you so much. And I want to say, let us pray. Oh, God, you are a God. And you are our God, and you are the God, and we give you thanks for that. And we are so glad that we are like those that wait for the morning, and because certainly you do show up, and you show out, and you bring us sustenance, and you feed us, and we still... Oh, 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 oh. And, uh, and political times, our social times, our, our times in our lives. And we also ask, oh God, a special prayer for Dot Jarman. Yes, sir. And that her going home will be the service for her. Amen. Yes, sir. And that it will not be beholden to anybody else's weird understandings of how they their unresolved grief usually plays out in funerals but that it will be a true tribute to her amen. 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 and we that's the way of putting it amen. <laughs> thank you lord <laughs> amen and we thank we thank you oh god for every voice here for everyone who has been participating and everyone who sat 
and in, in their quietude. And we ask that their spirits be lifted and that they may feel the spirit of the Holy Presence, of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, we pray that we do not grieve the Holy Spirit yes. Yes. in our meditations <laughs> on the scriptures. And in Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's children said, what? Amen. 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 Amen.